Hi, my name is Seb and welcome to The Prototype, a channel where I explore how to take ideas through to working prototypes. In this episode, the second of the Surf Track series, I'm going to test the assumption that I can build an electronic device that can track the movement of a surfboard as it goes down through a wave. We're going to go through a full electronic design and build, and later in the episode we get to see the first hardware prototypes. Let's get started. Thank you so much for watching, it means a lot to me. And if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing. So the project I'm working on is SurfTrack, a device that can be used to track the movement of a surfboard as it goes down through the wave to measure how awesome a ride was. This could be useful in potentially training or even judging. My process is to go through my main assumptions iteratively and to either validate or invalidate them to build a prototype. In the first video, which I'm linking to here, I validate my first assumption, which is that the community could potentially embrace this technology. I also invalidate my second, which is that I can build a waterproof enclosure. Hint, I can't. Well, I'm going to come back to the waterproof enclosure later, because in this episode, I want to focus on the next assumption. That is, I can build a hardware device that can track the movement of a board in 3D space. And for that, I need a hardware prototype. My process for designing a hardware prototype is to first start by thinking about the components I need, seeing if they can work together and testing that, then to design a circuit or schematic to connect them all together, and finally to lay out a circuit board that I then get manufactured. And like with the case, I start by sketching out a design. I like to design my circuits using building blocks. A basic embedded system has a microcontroller at the core, a group of sensors that measure the environment in some way, a group of effectors that affect the environment, a means to interact with the user, a way of communicating, and a power supply. In this case, what we want to do is measure the attitude or relative position of the board as it goes through the water. The exact location is not important, but rather how the board moves the water is. Fortunately, there's a sensor called an accelerometer, which can measure all of this, and you have one on your phone. I did think about using the accelerometers in a phone by putting it on a case, attaching that to the board, but whilst that might work on a snowboard, I don't think it'd work on a surfboard. I've used the MPU 6050 before, so I'm gonna go with that. There's heaps of support for it, and you can sample it thousands of times a second, much quicker than I need to. Now, we need to save this information somewhere. We're capturing the roll, pitch, yaw, as well as the angular acceleration, so six pieces of information all up. Each of these numbers is two bytes long, so each sample is 12 bytes long. I'm thinking 10 times a second is fast enough to sample, which means we're creating 120 bytes of data a second, or around 7K a minute. A two hour surf session will therefore need about 840 kilobytes of memory. Most microcontrollers have built in memory, but they're not usually big enough for this, so we're gonna need a memory chip. I could get away with two megabyte chip, but to give myself plenty of room, I set an eight megabyte SPI chip. I jump online and find the appropriate part. To communicate with the outside world, I'm gonna go with Bluetooth 5. At one megabyte per second, it's easily fast enough for my 840K payload. Now to the brain box, the microcontroller. Given I want to use Bluetooth, I'm tossing up between two processors I'm already familiar with, a Nordic NRA52 series or an ESP32, both of which have Bluetooth built in. I end up going with the NRA52 as it's sm smaller and as one of the things my research told me is that this thing has to be small for servers to want to stick it to their board. I've used all these components before and I know they work together, so I'm going to skip my usual step of getting dev kits and wiring them up manually. The process for designing a circuit is to first study the data sheets that come from the selected components and to follow the design guides that are located therein. I'm going to pop a link to every single one of the data sheets I used in the description below. circuit board. The first thing to do is make sure the circuit board fits within the case. To do this, I export the circuit board from my CAD application and get started laying everything out. I'm going to go with 0402 components and these are small enough to make the board compact, but still large enough that I can modify by hand if I need to. I'm going to try and keep the board to a two layer board where there's traces on the top and bottom as it significantly reduces the cost. I'm sticking to parts on one side of the board, again, to drive the cost down. 
The great thing about the NRF series of processors is that all the hardware registers can be mapped to any of the input-output pins. This gives me huge flexibility in how I lay out the design, meaning I can place parts close to the processor and then remap the pins based on my layout. I begin by placing components that can't move, like the antenna and the centered lead. Next, the processor, and then the main parts like memory and accelerometer around it. I really do enjoy doing layouts. I find it quite relaxing. I basically start with the main connecting buses, then work around the board laying out traces, trying to keep them all to one side and as compact as possible. Care needs to be taken with the antenna design. I'm using an F-Type PCB trace antenna that I've tested multiple circuits before. These need to be separated by a ground plane to ensure the best radiation pattern and therefore range. I could make the design smaller if I used a chip antenna, but for the sake of a few dollars, I decide the PCB trace antenna, which effectively is free. Now, export this back to the CAD application and see what it looks like. Finally, I export the Gerber files and upload these to a PCB assembly house. Now, for a small run like this, if I was pressed for time, I would probably do them by hand. But when it's only $30 to get them assembled, sometimes it's just not worth your time. All up, including parts, delivery, and assembly, it comes to around $20 per board. I ended up ordering 10 of these as I'm probably gonna destroy a few during testing. And I still haven't quite worked out the waterproof case yet. Anyway, now to wait three to four weeks for them to arrive. I'm pretty excited. Let's uh, take a look inside. I uh, ordered heaps more spare boards because uh, you never know. These look great. I love the blue. But what we're really interested in is the fully assembled ones. Okay, so we have our main processor, that's the uh, big one in the middle. To the right, we have the accelerometer and of course our flash memory chip. We have our first and second crystal oscillator, our power regulator, battery charger, and of course our flashing LED in the middle. Okay, let's get a closer look under the microscope. Okay, under the microscope, and we can see the main processor in the center here and the accelerometer to the right. What I want to check here is to make sure that the solder has reflowed correctly and that there's no balling or joins in the uh, solder joints. The manufacturer I use is fairly reliable and I've never really had too many problems, but it always pays attention if you've got the equipment to check it out yourself, particularly with sensitive components like the crystal here where the uh, solder joins are a little bit uh, tricky. The memory chip is another interesting one because the actual legs of the chip are underneath the circuit. And unfortunately with our X-ray machine, it's almost impossible to verify that's been correct, but it looks pretty square, so I'm happy with that. Uh, there's our white LED again. The reason the white LED looks yellow is because it's actually a blue LED that shines onto a yellow phosphor. The phosphor then emits white light. Okay, so the next thing to do is to test. Now, if you remember how I designed this device, it was in a series of blocks and each block can be tested in turn. The first block to test is the power supply one because frankly, if that doesn't work, nothing else will. To test this, I first need to solder the battery and a few power leads to the board. Okay, got some power hooked up to it. You can see there's five volts coming through. I want to see the, test the output of the voltage regulator down there. Uh, VDD is this pin here. 3.3 volts coming off that. So the power circuit seems to be working. 
Okay, testing the next components involves writing firmware, that is software that is installed onto the device. And I'm gonna leave all of that to the next episode. In that episode, we're gonna finish validating our two main assumptions, that we can build a tracker and a waterproof case to put it in. I'm gonna get these out into the real world, into the ocean, and get some real live data to see if we can work on our final assumption that we can actually produce meaningful data from this. I can't wait. As you can see, building and designing a hardware prototype is quite involved, but if you follow my basic block architecture model, use dev kits wherever possible, you can get a prototype up pretty quickly. I've had so much fun putting all this together and I really hope you've enjoyed watching it. I'm gonna leave with you some final footage of assembling the hardware in the case together. See you next time.